let's get going. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, Jeremy made sure that I was going to give my credentials because he knows that that's not my favorite thing to do. And uh, so I have a, so my name is Ted Wired and I am the founder of Golden Willow Retreat as well as Golden Willow Counseling. Golden Willow Retreat is a grief, loss and trauma center. Uh, it's an emotional sanctuary focused on those issues. Here outside of Taos, New Mexico, we only have two clients at a time. We call them guests. Most people come from between five and 14 days. Also, it's a program where somebody needs to have 30 days of recovery. Um, in other words, it's not a treatment center for drugs and alcohol, but actually for loss and trauma. And if someone does have sobriety, of course, those intermingle deeply. And we'll definitely talk about that today. So. Um, just uh, in, in addition to that, I've also had my own private practice um, in all types of therapy, really focusing on that existential therapy and solution focus and that area, as well as, of course, grief and trauma. Um, Golden Willow Counseling is a behavioral health center here in Taos, New Mexico, and we have 15 therapists and we have everything from intensive outpatient therapy to outpatient therapy and we run the drug courts here in Raton, here in Taos as well as in Raton, New Mexico. So we intermingle in a lot of different ways of recovery. I'm also the clinical supervisor for Rio Grande ATP, which is another intensive outpatient program located here in Taos as well as Las Vegas, New Mexico. So my fingers and hands and feet stay intermingled in a lot of different ways of emotional healing. Um, I have a doctorate in organizational leadership uh, focused really on leadership behaviors in the midst of change. My master's is in counseling with an emphasis in grief and loss. Um, I am a certified grief counselor as well. I'm an ordained minister, a non-denominational Christian minister. I would have loved to have been a multi-faith minister, but uh, government documents like to have something claimed. So I really love spirituality and We'll talk a lot on that today. I'm also a New Mexico certified school teacher, as well as a certified tennis pro. Um, so I've definitely gone to school for a long time to build up my area of knowledge. But more importantly, I'm a human being that walks this earth and really knows that through any types of controversies, victories in our life, we continue to grow and heal and be more of service. So that's, I think, all the credentials that Jeremy's gonna make sure I have. So yes, I'm Reverend Dr. Ted Wired, who happens to be a therapist um, and just a guy who likes to walk this world. I really thought a lot, and I actually had a PowerPoint because I didn't know which direction I'd go, but you know, we're all Zooming so much on the different formats, platforms, um, I really decided today I'm going to try to speak more as if everybody here is in front of me, the same way as when I worked at Betty Ford Center and we had our auditorium and we spoke there. Um, so we're going to go that direction and try to have it be a little bit more human, even though we have uh, we have this blockage right now called having to be on video, which does feed different parts of our brain, but at least we're connected. So um, I want to thank. Jeremy and Vista for all they do for our, our town. Um, they're arguing about when Vista started up. Well, I still remember being a 17 year old or a 16 year old construction worker and bringing adobes to the building to start to build those fireplaces from just a residential home. Um, I'm 58 years old, so you can do the math there. So I still remember when it was still adobe bricks and not even a building yet and talking about dropping off all the materials and going well this is going to be some place that helps people and i'm still grateful that since then it's grown and evolved and, and into what it is today and helps so so many people really appreciative of that um, gotten to co collaborate quite often with vista as well as the different providers um, and so thank you for having me I would like to take a moment and just uh, just a second so people can settle, including me, as we're taking care of all these different pieces and and really 
just put what's in the room deeply and why we're not all together and this whole thing called COVID-19 and a pandemic, um, people dying and the frontline workers, including a lot of the people within watching this right now. Um, and I'd like to just take a moment of silence for the families, the frontline workers, the people who have died, each of us, and the different ways as a world we need to continue to heal and grow. And I just want to take this moment of silence just to honor that. Thank you. Really want to honor all the people. Hopefully we get to start having healing and having this vaccine, um, more consciousness, and people start to be able to get over this pandemic so we can actually come together again. I look forward to someday kicking Jeremy's butt in golf, but right now we have to stay apart. I don't, I don't golf well, but I get to give a little bit of smack. Um, and so, here we get going. Julie will let me know on text if there's something I need to know. Um, and I'm just going to pretend all of you are in front of me. I'm going to start with a piece I call a preface, and it's The Edge. It's a book that I'm going to have come out probably in a couple years. I had a small book come out not long ago, and I can give that to you later on. This isn't for promotion. It's called Witnessing Ted, The Journey to Potential Through Grief and Loss. And it's really about healing. This next book is really going to be more on that piece. So here we go. So take a breath and let yourself just be here, um, letting go of all the different to-do lists that are always on our minds and trying to get here. I had to make sure I shoveled all the snow this morning and make sure all the cars started and then come to the office and like a true owner of any company, shovel all the snow and take out the trash. So letting go of those lists, you know, loss comes in so many different ways and so does addiction and so does recovery. And so I'm hoping you'll take this moment and let this story somehow relate to you or your clients or patients or guests, whatever you happen to have, wherever you happen to be working. The Edge. I inch closer to the rim of the cliff. Muscles tensed, ready to jump. My grief had pushed me to the edge. I was alone, more alone than I'd ever been before. I heard nothing but the drumbeat of my heart as I stared 365 feet down at the side winding boulder sucking river. I was scared, but there was nobody left who needed me and no other reason to be on this earth. My daughters had died three months before. My wife had died a couple years before that. My younger brother had died just before her. I'd flirted with dying before. The thought of dying was like a mocking, upbeat jingle that looped through my head 24 hours a day. 60 minutes an hour, and 60 seconds a minute. I believed it would be easier to join my dead family than to live, easier to die than to fight my anguish for one more day. The piercing silence broke. 10, nine, lightheaded, I leaned forward, tipping into the air, aimed for the canyon bottom. My hands led the way as if slicing the air to wake, make way for my body and the tattered soul attached to my heel. I fell head first, faster and faster and faster, not breathing until a scream exploded from my chest. I dragged sharp, clean air into my lungs and screamed again and again and again for happiness, for sadness, for fear, for excitement, for loss, for love, for life. Falling, the river rushed toward me. Wind moaning in my ears, my shirt billowed and collapsed, clinging to my chest as if it were wet. Time stopped. I suddenly wanted to live, and I remembered what living might mean. I stretched out my arms, not to dive, but to protect myself from smashing into that hard water. Just before my fingertips broke the water surface, the bungee harness grabbed my ankles, and I was jerked 
back up into the sky. As I swirled and bounced and bobbled at the end of the rope, my heart felt large for the first time in months. In that moment, in that present moment, there was no past. There was no future. There was only breath. In that moment, there was no catastrophe, no trauma. There was only breath. I bounced up and down and up and down, my body jiggling, hands reached out. I laughed. And I was lowered to my feet. Standing unsteadily, my ankles free, I breathed in the air that seemed as bright as the sunlight, warming my shoulders. The world looked new. The world looked fresh in that moment. That day, looking up at the rim of the cliff from which I'd fallen, I began my journey to healing, my journey to find Ted, my journey to find my authentic self. So please breathe that in for a minute. Have it be your story, whatever that means, from addiction and the fall of addiction to finally landing and looking up and knowing there's still a journey ahead of healing, but in that continuum of care that Adam spoke of at the beginning, we start that journey. And as that journey begins, potential begins to open up. As you absorb that, think about your own journey. Today I get to talk about one of my favorite topics, and that's the authentic self, which I try to my best to do to my best ability in every second and every moment. If I'm lucky, I can do it once a day. So uh, um, I decided that I didn't want this to be from a research point of view, even though I'll talk about science, because it's so, so deep in my heart. It's what I actually feel allowed me to start to take my boat of life, put a keel on that boat, as well as a rudder, have winds in my sails, and on those tough days, even have a solar panel that I can start up the little trolling engine. So it did save my life at once. It moved me out of wanting to die, truly just wanting to die every day. And it allowed me to move into a place where now it's quite the map that I do my mini fourth with, um, meaning a four step and a mini inventory of just where I am and see how I need to be realigned as well as a, of course, a ninth and a tenth step as well. Um, it's allowed me to do that piece, but it's also built the passion that lets me be who I am today. But I want to back up. Um, Goldmill Retreat's been here 20 years, so I'm going to back up even before that. I'm going to back up to me being a kiddo, and Dr. Hoff's going to talk about narratives today. You know, I believe grief, loss, and recovery has been stolen from us, and we've forgotten how to do so many things because we don't have storytellers. And so over the next hour and somewhat of in time, um, so Julie tells me I have to stop. Um, really want to just tell a story. And I could back it up in science, and today I'm not going to. If someone wants my PowerPoint, I'll be happy to send it to them. Um, so as a kiddo, I grew up in Taos, New Mexico. The Taos was 4% white in the high schools um, and in any of the public schools, and a um, lot of racism lot of just conflict and also such an amazing place to grow up. In high school I met my sweetheart who later on became my wife and so my life began on a new format. Um, so from high school we went off to different colleges. Um, I wanted to ski race so I went off to University of Nevada Reno. She went down to New Mexico State University and we started that piece. Well I missed her too much, so I came to University of New Mexico to ski race, and uh, she was still down at New Mexico State University, and I was learning about these transitions. Well, still missed her too much and wanted to be with her, which I'm grateful for. So I went down to New Mexico State University, luckily got to play tennis for them, 
and uh, and be with my high school sweetheart, future wife, Leslie. Um, luckily, I got to play tennis for them because I didn't realize school was supposed to be this academic endeavor. But through that, I learned that I really liked education, so I got my degree in in education. Um, Leslie and I came back to Taos, New Mexico, where we'd both grown up. We started our life, me as a little high school, actually as a fifth grade teacher, and her at the Taos News as an advertising manager. So life started out, and we were rocking and rolling. We got to ski, we got to be in our hometown, and we started moving forward. Soon, a couple years later, we uh, realized that we were pregnant, which we wanted, and uh, we were so excited and so happy. And Carrie was getting ready to be born, and I almost died. I got something called cryptosporidiosis, which at the time they didn't know what that was. And with that, I uh, ended up in the hospital with Leslie, eight months pregnant. Um, she actually did the tour of the hospital with my tennis pro rep, the rep who sponsored me in equipment as I was quarantined. Um, I left my body. Uh, I saw everyone looking down, being very nervous. I then returned to my body. And after uh, a little while, I started to uh, heal. Um, luckily, they started to figure out what I had. And really, after a lot of IVs and a long time and losing a lot of poundage, um, I got out of the hospital just in time for Carrie to be born. And really, that was kind of forgotten, even though I was exhausted for the next couple of years, because Carrie was more important. We continued with our life. Soon after that, we uh, decided we'd have another little kiddo, we hoped, and uh, got pregnant. We're really excited, but we had a miscarriage. And this was the first time Leslie and I were kind of on different pages. From that, um, you know, I had the loss of being excited. She had the loss of someone and something that she was already in relations with. That was confusing to us. But luckily, we got pregnant again and uh, things were moving forward. And right before Amy was born, my brother Richard died in a shipwreck up in Alaska. Um, and so that was really heart-wrenching to me. And uh, he was my little brother, and I felt I was supposed to protect him. And I was really sad. I was actually at a tennis tournament in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, came home. But soon after that, Amy was born, so Richard was kind of just pushed away as well, even though it hurt so much. Amy rocked our world. She was this excited little girl that was just so pumped with life. She came out and immediately went, ah! and was just there in that form. So Amy was born, and we started our new life, and we had these two awesome little girls. And about a year into Amy's life, we found out Leslie had sarcomatoid renal cell carcinoma and was told she had lived for seven weeks. This shattered us as I was 28 years old, she was 28 years old, and the girls were one and three. Um, she ended up living for two years, dancing with that cancer and dancing with life, and uh, we learned so much, and she spent every day trying to find ways to heal and grow, which we all did. But within those two years, there was intense loss, and when the time was up, she did die, um, leaving Carrie and Amy and I to fend for ourselves in our own ways. Um, Carrie was now five and Amy was three. We, uh, we start our life and some days I would put them to bed in their school clothes for the next day because I just knew I was too exhausted and ask them not to pee the bed, they never did, and take them to school. I'd also braid their hair in the morning and they get to school and they would have their hair re-braided by the teachers because it definitely didn't look good. But we became quite a team. Um, and so life started to unfold once again. And so a couple years after that, I was actually coaching a tennis tournament with the Taos Tigers in Albuquerque. And uh, there was a horrendous car crash, which Amy, my youngest, died immediately. Um, my mother-in-law, Rachel, their grandma, died immediately in that car crash. And Carrie lived for one day. This car crash was actually right down the road from Vista. Um, I was shattered, I was destroyed, and I was a mess. All the things I had defined my world and built my identity around were shattered and decimated. And so I started my journey. 
Now, luckily, I chose to live because for a long time, all I wanted to do was die and be with my family. Um, I can promise you today, I'm not confined and defined by the story, part of the story I just shared. It actually helps me today and loss sucks. And there isn't a day I don't wish I could still get a hug from Carrie or Amy or Leslie or Richard. And yet I'm not confined and defined by that. Instead, they become the passion that helps me move forward. Um, so grief is redefining myself, which was the talk that luckily I got to give last time. Um, and it's that redefining piece. Today I get to talk about in search of oneself. So if we remember that loss comes in so, so many different types of forms and formats. And so we can have loss of time. We can have loss of dreams. We can have loss of hair. Luckily that one doesn't bug me, but I know it does for others. We can have menopause. We can have loss of virginity. We can have loss of location, meaning geographically or a home. And so loss can come in all these different ways, not just in death or divorce or addiction, but in so, so many forms and formats. And in each one of those, when the foundation of who I was, how I, how I defined myself is cracked, shaken, dismantled, decimated, I do grief if I choose. And grief is that redefining into where I am. Now, the bummer with that is there's not a clear path and it's not a straight path. It's a swirly, messy method. If I can stay conscious enough, I can start to redefine myself into who I am today. If I'm lucky enough. I think a lot about Humpty Dumpty. And Humpty Dumpty had a big fall. He fell off the wall and all the king's horses and all the queen's horses and all the king's men and all the king, queen's men and the king's women and the queen's women and all the politically wrecked statements could not put Humpty Dumpty back together again. But that yoke was still there. Who could put Humpty Dumpty back together again? Not as the old Humpty Dumpty, but as the new person was Humpty Dumpty. And so that was me. So I'd fallen off the wall and I was shattered and I was decimated. And the very first thing I wanted to do was reach out and try to find that rescue. But it wasn't there. And so I had to go into that deep, dark cavern and start going down to off of the wall and look through each piece of that shell and start seeing who am I. And maybe where I'd learned survival skills that were now unproductive habits what was truly my core, and all these different pieces. And through that, hopefully I could honor and be that yoke with boundaries that allow it to be protected and allow new information in, but not a shell. No matter what, I could not be and I cannot be who I used to be. So that kind of brings us up to, up to today. Um, what happened after uh, I fell off and we moved into those different pieces is I actually hit the road. I didn't have money, but I had heard that if you die, credit cards are cleared. I don't know if that's true, so don't take that as a fact. And so I took off because of Leslie's cancer. I had high credit limits on a bunch of credit cards. So I went to Maui um, where I stayed, and really there I sat in front of the beach thinking, how could I just swim out and join my family and let the currents take me away? Well, luckily I didn't do that. I ended up going over to New Zealand where I hung out for a while, trying to search for myself and just regain myself. Ended up in Australia where I ended up getting cat scratch fever, um, almost died in Australia. Walked around Australia with 104 temperature, not knowing it because my brain wasn't working right. I just kept thinking Australia was so hot. Slowly came back to Maui, slowly came back to Taos, and slowly came back actually to the United States. And all I really still wanted to do was die. And how could I die? Somewhere along the way, I decided I couldn't kill myself, even though that's what I had planned, and that's why I didn't care about the credit cards. But I still just wanted to die. 
And that suicide jingle definitely was in my head. And since I didn't feel I could kill myself, I just wished there was some way I could trip or get run over or something to end the anguish that I was in. I bobbled around for quite a while, making mistakes as well as just trying to live. And uh, I just could not get rid of this weight behind me. And so I checked myself into a treatment center, treatment center for drugs and alcohol. And I've worked at Betty Ford Center and I've spoke all over the country and parts of Canada at treatment centers. So this doesn't surprise me. I showed up, I knocked on the door at the treatment center and said I wanted to come. Of course, they couldn't just take me right then. Um, so they said, well, how many beers do you have? And I said, none. They said, well, how much hard liquor do you drink? And I said, no, maybe a shot a day, no, in a year. And they asked me all the drug, all the substance abuse survey questions. And finally, I think they just said, you must be lying and minimizing, come on in. Um, but I wasn't, but my drug of choice had been taken. And that was my daughter's and there was no dealer. And I craved every moment. And I just wanted to die if I couldn't get a hit of them. At that point, I didn't have any spiritual hit from them. And even today though, I would do about anything to be able to hold them one more time. So luckily I got into treatment. Um, not in the usual way, and luckily they, I got to stay for those 30 days, and it saved my life. It was like a UFO had picked me up, put me on a different planet, gave me time to heal. I had had some amputations. I had never had had time for them to heal. It gave me time to be in the recovery room and find me once again and find out where I had prostheses and where I had to heal rather than having gaping wounds that just ran my life. And so from there, I left and I was still pretty confused about this God thing. Shendo should get a good laugh out of that. Um, I've talked with Patrick many times and really enjoy his beliefs and his services. Um, and so I was like, you know, this God thing is pretty weird. And so I went to ministerial school because that's what an April Fool's Aries does. When something's weird, you better go figure out what, what it is. So I went to ministerial school where I met my present wife, Marcella. And we, one day, she actually said, are you ever gonna do that grief thing? And so we packed everything up, drove back from North Carolina where I had been a dean in the, in, at a small college and came back to Taos. We parked the RV in front of my parents' house and started Golden Willow Retreat, which luckily isn't still at their house. <laughs> um, from there, we started Golden Willow Retreat. It grew, got our hands all rough from construction and building it, kind of the same way I'd helped with Vista back in the day. Went back, got my master's, and then became a therapist as well. Started this place. Um, and so we had Golden Willow Retreat, Golden Willow Counseling, um, then I went back and got my doctorate because I had seen how I come from the individual up to the family. But you know what? We spend a lot of time in work. And so I also wanted to look at how are leaders working with loss and change and having that trickle down back into the family. I do almost everything for the younger people. But for the younger people to have a chance, I think we have to... Uh, have the older people maybe have a little bit of wisdom. So, um, but most of my passion is for the younger people. And so I knew if we could have parents coming back home and caregivers coming back home, and we could also have individual work, we could have families and start to rebuild safety once again. So that's my story. And it doesn't confine and define me, but it gives me a lot of wisdom hopefully, but it definitely gives me a lot of passion and it helped me find out who I am. I believe there's a big difference between serenity and peace. I find serenity is in my heart and peace is external, which means it doesn't happen very often. Last night when I was hiking in the mountains alone and the storm was coming in and the sun was setting and there were angel elevators, as I call them, the light coming through onto the valley, I had peace and I had serenity at the same moment. That's quite a God shot, so I'm pretty lucky on that. So but I'm going to jump onto the board, um, and 
I could back all this up, but I'd rather not because this is also my spiritual path. I hope something resonates for you. And if it doesn't, that's okay too because it means you got to look at it and realize it doesn't. So I found what I'm going to talk about helps me as a therapist because I can have some idea maybe where someone else is coming. I hope it gives me a little more emotional intelligence as I look outside of myself and where other people are coming as well as into myself and how am I navigating the energies around me, as well as the, how I'm connecting. So at one point, this saved my life, and then it became a map for me, and then it became a vehicle, and now it's even the fuel that drives my passion to be of service and help others in their time of desperado and difficulties, or just in their time of needing some support. So I use it professionally, personally, spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, physically, and any of the other leads you want to call. So you could sit and debate me, but you can't because you're all muted. Um, but that's okay too. Please take what works for you and leave the rest behind, as we like to say. Um, so I'm going to stand up and see if I have to change things around a little bit. And I actually finally get to use a chalkboard again. I'm asking Luella if she could get me a water at some point. Um, so I believe when we come into this world, we start our world. And here I am as this true identity, my perfect self, peace, love, joy, curiosity, hopefully safety. That starts to change pretty quickly. So we're going to just talk about some of that stuff. Thanks, Luella. And I'll also get out of the way and get in the way of this. But our true identity, I see, is we already have. Some people like to see it as a blank slate that we slowly grow. That's okay, too. Um, so when we come into this world, we have our true identity. I'm actually going to share mine, which I don't do very often in public. I do it out at Golden Wheel Retreat. But I'm really hoping you can take it and have it be what works for you. So. As I claim these different identifiers of me, please know I'm not trying to tell you those are yours. Um, you need to go down and figure out what those are for you. I can only talk about them because they're, they're mine. And so I can talk more from a passionate place by being vulnerable and being intimate by telling my true self. So I believe we come in and we have this true identity. And so this true identity, we slowly have. So mine, as of today, would be Purity of intent. Now, that's the only one that I have as a number one, is purity of intent. It's what even gives me enough bravery to stand in front of all of you, in front of a camera, with you guys everywhere else, talking today. If it can help someone else and help me in some form or way, and I have that intention, that's purity of intent. It gives me that bravery. It also gives me, when I'm coming from that purity of intent, if I goof, I can always make amends. So to my best ability, I try to come from a place of purity of intent. So that one is just me. I'm always trying to be there. From there, I have on honesty and integrity. Honesty and integrity, some people might take apart, others may not. Selfishly, the more honest I am and the more integritous, the less amends I have to make, so that's a good thing but it just aligns with me. I want to be honest and I want to speak my truth and come from that place and walk my talk. I'm a spiritual seeker. Much more than a religious seeker. That's okay, that just happens to be me. I'm of service to people. because that's so important to me. And I also just added humor. Now I've been working on this since 1997. And I just added humor just a couple of years ago because these have to be the things that settle. I had enough wounds around humor that I couldn't claim it for quite a while. So really, if you notice, I only have about five identifiers. 
But these are what make me up. These are the things that just go chunk. I don't have to think about them. Um, and they might be totally different for someone else. My wife, going to the same ministerial school, she's service to animals. If there was less people, the animals would have a better chance. So each of us has our own piece. Now, it doesn't mean I sit straight in this. I'm still a human. But these are what make me up. I like to think of them as a thumbprint. Each of us makes up. We all have our outer circle or oval or whatever you want to call it. And inside is our fingerprint. So the outside of this is like a chalice. It's what holds us. It's the universal laws, the universal values, the golden rule, the Ten Commandments, the eight laws of Buddha, or whatever else you want to say. I like to kind of think of it as the capsule, being good to yourself, being good to others, and being good to the earth. And so that holds us. And then inside that, we're each individualized, making up that print, just like the snowflakes out my window right now or the leaf, or our thumbprint, or our earlobes, all those pieces that just make us special. Now, we might have commonalities, but also there's just the piece. So I like to think, oh, this, 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 this. Now, there's not things I couldn't be better at. I don't get to bend over in here, but you just won't see me. I can do a lot more yoga. But it doesn't mean it's my truth. Now, I can do it, and it can better my life, but it doesn't go chunk. I have a friend who, if he did not do yoga, he would die. He would either suicide or overdose probably within a year, and he knows this. Um, and so it's a piece that just sits deeply in him and keeps him on his path. So each of us has this piece of our true identity. In that, we start our life. Now, here's some... Some recovery get a little bit upset, but uh, I like to think about survival skills rather than character defects. I like to think about those survival skills because almost everything I've ever done came from a survival skill to, to keep me in some situation. When we have fear in our child, oh good, you can see. Fear equals abandonment. Abandonment equals death. So in my core of my body, when I do emotional regression, which we talked about last time after a loss, I go back to a very young age where fear equals me not being safe, not getting the breast and bottle, not getting a blanket, not having shelter, not having Maslow's hierarchy, which means it equals death. And so my brain, this wonderful brain, this computer that's always trying to keep me alive, takes this very, very seriously. So it invents ways of surviving this world. So instead of character defects, I call them survival skills that maybe have become non-productive and usually unconstructive habits non-constructive habits. I also do believe addiction is a disease. So it can also lead to the actual medical disease of addiction. And we can work our way with that as well. So if we can keep this in mind, my system is going to invent ways to survive my environment. They might not always serve me. And so in loss, when I'm shattered, I actually have the opportunity to find myself again and maybe remove or release some of these survival skills that don't serve me anymore. Now, the psyche is very protective. So the psyche also doesn't want me to think I'm going to kill a piece of it. And I'm not. This is me. All my history makes me up. So. It's not a matter of identifying these and removing them. It's a matter of transforming them so they become my teachers and help me stay aligned. So letting my psyche know that, giving it permission, allows my psyche to bubble up different pieces in my inventory in order to heal. So with that in mind, I'm honoring our survival skills that have allowed us to be here today. And boy, this electronic world, I'm pushing every survival skill ever.
It's allowed me to be here today. It makes me up, but it doesn't have to run my show. So we can keep that in mind. I have this true identity. I'm born. Ta -da! I have purity of intent. I have honesty and integrity. I'm a spiritual seeker. I'm service to people, and I like to be a goofball. So that's my true identity. Well, I start getting losses. I start getting banged up. Maybe I wasn't fed right when I wanted to. Maybe I wasn't taken out of the crib right when I wanted. Maybe I didn't have a crib and I just fell off the couch. All these different pieces that make me up. So the true identity invents the scared child. The scared child is there to protect me. So these, nowadays, we call codependent behaviors. I just call them survival skills from a scared child. So I pout, I cry, I scream, I seek approval, I people please. I'm a perfectionist. I'm a chameleon. I'm a martyr. I'm a victim. I'm an addict. Poor, poor me, pour me another drink. Wine, 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 give me some more wine. I'm all these different things. Now, each one of you gets to do your own inventory. I'm not doing yours. Actually, I'm writing down anything that happens to be popping into my head. But I look at these things and I start to realize that they have a reason to be here. The true identity was getting dinged up. It needed to find a way to survive. So it came up with these different ways. In other words, help me, help me, help me, help me. And so we're in that emotional regression. And in that emotional regression, I go back to a very early age. And I look for an external locus of control. And if I can get that external locus of control through these, then I think I'll be rescued. That also includes how we move into addiction. So these are here, and of course, there could be many, many more. Um, and they're just different ways I'm trying to leverage to survive. Well, the scared child's scared, and it's sitting there going, ah! And these aren't working. I'm still scared. So the scared child invents the bully. It overpasses the true identity and invents the bully. And the bully says, I'll protect you, scared child. I'll rescue you for sure. And so becomes the judger, the dominant, the entitled, the elitist. I like to think about those for a minute. Entitled and elitist could be in money, could be in degrees, it could be in uh, intellect, it could be in experience. So remember, these can come in many, many, many different forms. Um, aggressive in an unhealthy way. Um, you know, I like to think a lot about the judger because quite often that's cognitive dissonance. Oh, look, Ted forgot to button his shirt. Why didn't he wear a tie? Rather than trying to get the information. So we define these ways to give us distance. Bottom line, the bully is anywhere I am trying to dominate someone else, have a hierarchical differential. I am bigger than you, while the scared child is cowering. Please help me. I'm smaller than you. So we move into power or devour. This, of course, would include the addict. F it. I'm going to use anyways. Now, most of us know one better than the other, just from the way we were brought up. I know on my bully, I actually... I call it the cold computer. Data in, data out. Boom. Now, it doesn't mean these don't serve me. And also, they, of course, intermingle. Victimhood can always be a perpetrator. I'm trying to do guilt bombing. Being aloof. Not giving the information. Withholding love. I just remembered we were taping. The scared child just got scared because I don't pay attention to my spelling, but uh, that's okay. My true identity will hold that scared child. So the bully sits there and tries to find ways to dominate. 
to be assertive in maybe unhealthy ways and be aggressive because it wants to protect the scared child. Well, the bully gets exhausted. The bully can't hold up either. This is that whole step one. And it drops too. But when it drops, it underpasses the true identity and attacks the scared child. I suck. I'm a piece of crap. I should just die. And so it gets caught in the circle of craziness of trying to be rescued. I don't deserve to be rescued. I'm a piece of crap. I need to attack someone else and I need to move back and forth. Somewhere along the way, there's usually a bump, a window. And most of you that are working in this field, the last time we had a lot of teachers as well, that includes that field and anywhere else just called life. We watch for those windows. I always say it's the one time I'm willing to work harder than my client is when those windows open up because they also close very, very quickly. When that window opens up, we get to have a peekaboo at ourselves. They can actually scare us because it's not our norm. We become comfortably miserable. So it might close up really quickly. But we have that peekaboo. A chance to start to see ourselves because we have forgotten who we are because we've been so busy with the bully and the scared child just trying to survive. Please remember once again, their survival skills that can become my teachers. I'm not trying to get rid of them. Why would my psyche fuck something up if it thinks I'm just going to do a whack-a-mole? So instead, we realize these are our losses. These are our wounds. From these survival skills, we can do healing. Now, please, when you're talking to a client or somebody in the midst of loss or early in recovery, we don't go in and throw a bunch of sugar and throw this at them. They need to sit in that piece and slowly have these pieces grow and evolve. So as this happens, we break the circle and we get to start to move more and more into our true identity. Healing, I believe, comes from the menu or the recipe of being seen, heard, and valued authentically by self as well as others, and I believe with a higher power. I believe that piece is always there. So we start to have this piece, and we start to slow down the circle. You notice I didn't throw anything off the bus. Now, as I start to find myself, guess what? These guys start fighting as well. Right now, my boy could be saying, Ted, you're full of BS. You lied just the other day. You weren't working your path. You went to bed at 7 p.m. rather than doing your clinical notes. But that's because the bully doesn't trust me. Remember, I'm still a human. So I'm still going to veer back and forth. And these are going to move back and forth. Also, I have learned these skills very, very well all the lifetime. Can you get a drink? So it doesn't mean I can't use them from my true identity. When I was the dean at a college in North Carolina, a basketball coach came and said, Ted, I have just found the best basketball player out in South Africa. And I really want him. Can I have some more scholarship money? I looked at him. I said, you know what? You've used up all your academic money. You've used up all your scholarship money for sports. You've used up your Christian money. You've used up everything. Sorry, I can't give you any more money. He's like, Ted, 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 Ted. And finally, I just said, go back to the gym. So I had to pull a piece out of me and become that place. And then I just had to remember to put that file back rather than have it run my world. So we start to do these pieces. From here, I can start coming more and more from this true identity. Now, usually here I give a talk that includes others, but I can't call you up. So I'm going to try to do it without you. So the way I see this is here I am. Ta -da! Peace, love, wonder, it's so beautiful. Uh, 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 uh. I'm getting my losses. So I invent the scared bully, the scared child. Please 
please take care of me. Please love me. Oh, please do this. So this little scared child is asking all the different ways to be safe, to be rescued, and coming up with any way to have that rescuing happen. It's getting tired, so it invents the bully. I will rescue you, little one. Well, these two slowly start to be up front, and then they start colliding with one another. Now, in almost all true religious writings and that sort of thing, most people will say, agree, God gave us one thing, and that was free will. So as this is happening, the true identity slowly starts to slide into the back seat, and we have these two fighting for the steering wheel because they don't trust each other. But sooner or later, we bunk into the tree. In that moment, I have the chance to start my transformation through grief. I get to go up and I get to say, scared little child, thank you for keeping me safe. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. I just got a message from Julie. Um, I'll go over that in a minute. Scared little child, please, please, please let me. And so I take that scared child, I put it in the back seat, I put on its seat belt, and then I take the bully. Maybe it's a little more difficult. I put it in the back seat, put on the harness. And now from here, the true identity, I drive. From here, I start to listen to these two while I make the decisions from my true self. Now, Julie's just asked me, thank you, Julie, by the way. Um, I hope it wasn't too long ago. I forgot to look at my phone. Um, Julie happens to be the one who's doing a lot of the stuff behind the scenes. So uh, when I say Julie, she's not my imaginary person sitting over here. Just like Luella is not my imaginary person. She's the one who's working in front of me right now. Um, so thank you, Julie. So I'm going to go back through these lists, and then we'll come back to that car again. So these could be a lot of different words. This is our inventory. This is a mini four, with a different way of looking at a step four. So our scared child could have many different adjectives. So here I have the powder, the crier, the screamer, the seeker of approval, the people pleaser, the perfectionist, the chameleon, the something, oh, the martyr. The victim, the addict, and this list can go on. We each have our own tools that we've learned, but that should spark some ideas within you or possibly other people you know. Please don't therapize someone unless you have their permission. We're not supposed to be doing other people's inventory, but it can give us ideas of where they're coming from. So that list could go on and on, but that's the scared child. All the different ways we're trying to be rescued. The bully. The judger, withholder of love, the aloof, the dominant, the entitled, the elitist, the aggressive one, that would be in a more of a, a perpetrating way, the addict, the cold computer, any of these areas where I'm trying to dominate. So uh, hopefully that helps out on that piece. So but in this, I'm going to come back. So the true identity is now driving the car. The scared child are, and the bully are in the back seat. Now, please remember something very important. With the limbic system, all stimuli first goes there. That's to keep me safe. So actually, the scared child and the bully get all information before my frontal lobe, which is where the true identity lives. So that stimuli comes in. And it says, ah, or, Arr! and it does these pieces. So in honoring them and listening to them, I can then move to my frontal lobe to make decisions, make discernment for my true identity. So I'm going to tell you a story here. The first half of the story is true. The second half I'm making up. But it means I'm not lying because I told you I'm making it up. And maybe I'm not making it up because I use it a lot. So when I was 13 or 14 years old, coming from the junior high, I had my little Yamaha 100, and I worked at Taos, Texaco, which is now McDonald's. And so, but back then, I'd take my little Yamaha 100, I'd get off school, I'd go over there, I'd park my bike, 
I'd get off, I'd clean the men's bathroom, then I'd clean the women's bathroom. Then I'd go inside and the older guys would give me a hard time, tease me. It was all fun. And then they'd go home. And from 5.30 to 9, I would run the gas station. Running the gas station, I guess there weren't labor laws back then. I'm not sure. But uh, um, somehow I was able to do this. And, and so running the gas station, then I changed tires, um, which was on a ramp. And you heated them up and put the bead over and you fix those. And it was full service, so then you took care of the people at the gas station. And so this is what I do till nine o'clock so that I could have enough money to buy my new pair of skis. And so those were my evenings and I liked it and it was fun. If I sold enough Haviland 1040 oil, I also got a dime bonus for each can of oil I sold. So things were good. Well, in Taos at the time, there was a really sad underbelly and it was very racist. And they had something that they called honky hunting. And this is where people would find a white person alone, circle them up and beat them up. And, uh, and one night when I was sitting there closing down the gas station right at nine o'clock, um, and then back then you actually turned off the, the pumps. I don't know what you do now. I think it's all computer now. But uh, I was turning off the pumps and I was on the last pump, the fourth pump. Now, please remember I'm four foot 11. I know that for sure because I wanted to be five foot. I was 99 pounds because I wanted to be 100 pounds. So I was this tiny, tiny little munchkin. And all of a sudden, I was turning off the last pump. I see a couple low riders pull in, a couple high riders, and a couple other cars. And these guys get out of their car. And they're about 25 years old. And they have clubs. And they have the old timing chain that's wrapped up. And they're just big. And they start coming my way. But still, it's all true. And so I, you know, I can't run away on my little Yamaha 100. I'm a tiny person, and so I just think I'm going to die. And they keep coming my way. I had heard about this, so I was scared. And as they got about mm, 20, I'm trying to look down the room, probably 25 yards from me, out of nowhere, I grabbed the nozzle of the gas tank, gas station pump, grabbed the lighter and said, come on! I'm going to blow you up. I'm going to blow me up. I'm going to blow the whole world up. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And they all jumped in their cars. They, well, they walked back to their cars and drove away. So the bully came out and saved my life. Now, it doesn't mean I wasn't really, really scared. It was so hard to be able to even work my motorcycle to go home. I was so scared. My muscles were so tight, and that motorcycle didn't want to work. When I got home, of course, I couldn't tell my mother or father, stepfather because if I did, I wouldn't be able to work and then I wouldn't be able to pay for my skis. And then later on, I couldn't tell them because if I told them, I'd be in trouble for not telling them. So when they talk about why didn't they say something 20 years ago, here's some of the reasons. We bury our secrets on top of one another until it just seems like we'll die for telling them. So that part of the story is true. In the middle of that, now I'm going to shift gears. And so this part is not true as far as I know, but maybe it is because this would be unconscious. Our office is pretty close to town, so it's we'll pretend it was this fall. So I walk up by the bank, and so I'm standing on the side of the road, and all of a sudden there's something coming, and my little scared child goes, Watch out, here they come, they got clubs, they got mallets, they're gonna take us out. Oh no, 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 no. And the boy says, Let them come, I want to blow up the world. Well, me, with these two in the back, I can say, wait a minute, you guys. We came to listen to the homecoming parade. Those are the band members and those are the drums, and they're not going to hurt us. If I'm incorrect, we now have cell phones. I'm now five foot 10 and 170 pounds, and I have a car, so we will be okay. In that moment, by doing that piece, I'm healing an old trauma by having a different experience with a true identity, listen to these two, but they came back to make a decision from here. There's discernment. And in that moment, the scared child and bully don't have as much dominance over my everyday decisions. So this is a big piece within the scared child, within the bully, 
being survival skills from losses and traumas, experiences of my past, that now I can have them with discernment decide on actions for my true identity. Now, please remember, we don't just all of a sudden one day go, da-da, here's my true identity. I started playing with this idea in 1997. And I just added humor two years ago. So if you choose to do this, which I challenge you to do, what I did at the beginning is I just took a pencil and wrote things down. You know, there were a lot of things I wanted to be or I saw someone else had. And I'd put them down. Maybe I do still want to be more like that and they're good teachings for me. But I'm looking for those pieces that just go chunk. This is me. This is where my passion resonates. This is my yoke. And I'm removing the shell. And then I can build a porous boundary to help me work the world around me. So that is how we work. And of course, I'm going to jump tangentially for a second. This, of course, could be the ego, the id, and the superego. You could also go very Jungian, and these could be the archetypes that play within our system, but it gives us a way to balance and start to find it. I, I think we are born with this, and we start to forget. Doesn't mean it's not still there. We just start to forget. And through our losses and conscious grief and trauma and emotional recovery, these we start to remember, re-member. We start to become back to ourself. This is really big in sobriety, emotional sobriety, as well as substance and alcohol sobriety. Where I can start to realize is where I get off skew. I can start to be aware of these guys. And if they're acting up, I know I'm out of balance. This morning, I'm driving into town after shoveling everything. It's like, oh man, they told me there's gonna be a big number of people in an electronic world. And I don't like electronic world. I don't care if they're all here, but I won't even be able to see them. And I get tired of looking at myself. Uh, take a minute, Ted, stop, halt. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired, and I had an S, sad. Okay, well this morning I'm gonna go get some breakfast before I come in. I know Julie's on the other end, so when I can't find the link because Jeremy sent it to me, but it's sitting in my spam, but I'm a little jacked up, so I forget to even look in my spam, and so I know I can be okay. And so I can move back to my true identity. Where we get in trouble is when we go against this and come from these places. And they are the dominant factor that are running the show. So when I feel these things get flurried, it's like having my car out of alignment and I need to take it into the shop, take that breath and get realigned. So there's the cognitive side of that um, and just that piece. I'm gonna shift gears and I don't think I need to take a break because you guys probably get to go take breaks whenever you want. Julie will tell me differently if we actually need to take a break. Um, I don't know if you guys are in your homes or if you're at offices, if you all have your masks on or any of those places. You might think about the news, and this isn't a political statement. Um, thanks, Julie. She let me know I was fine. And of course, we all know fine means freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional, or change that up to something else. But thank you, Julie. Appreciate letting me know. So um, I'm going to continue. So if you think about just where the world is right now, you will see how these are being played out and how core values and true identifications are being rocked, shattered, forgotten. And maybe we've forgotten that. We're trying to rebuild during this dismantling time that foundation once again. We're not going to get rid of these, but they can become our scars of wisdom and our survival skills that maybe can be conscious and we can use them in positive ways. So please keep that in, in mind. Um, so I'm gonna jump on you, not jump away, well, I'll do that too, but uh, shift gears. I'm still gonna use this model and I'm gonna talk about a little bit more 
about where this goes and how it fits into my spirituality and passion. So the way this whole piece came up was me going to treatment. I just wanted to die. The idea of dying had become almost a uh, suboxone for me. It didn't really take away my craving for Carrie and Amy, but it subdued it enough for me to be able to survive because I knew I could always die. And so always having that idea of being able to have that choice is such a big part. And so I went to treatment knowing that that was a big part and that I needed to work with. And so as we were working through the treatment, um, we started working on different parts and I had this time and I felt like I was in a recovery room. So we got to about day 20, day 23, and from working at Betty Ford Center and other treatment centers as well, um, about then you're hoping that maybe a step three was, is starting to happen on some level. And, and in a very simple forms, I'm starting to believe I can turn my will over to a higher power of my understanding. This piece was really, really hard for me. I'd kind of given up on God. Whatever God means, whatever word you want to use, I'm not going to spend time on that debate today. So please, if it's a triggering word, just change it to whatever works for you. Um, if I can ask for that permission. God to me was this evil thing that steals children, gives 28 year old beautiful awesome women cancer and kills them by 30 and takes away my brother with one huge enormous wave gone like that. God is evil. If God's so evil, I'm not gonna believe in God, but if I don't believe in God, why do I keep asking for God for help and why am I angry at God? And like I said, that got me to ministerial school. But how can I turn my will over to a higher power if that is my definition of God? One of the other things that happens in recovery is we also, just like in developmental, emotional development, as a growing up, we can redefine our higher power as we grow and heal. So about day 20 something, I was called into the office. Now this treatment center didn't believe in anything was done one-on-one. -on -one. Everything was group. So I had seen people pound on that door. Let me, let me pay my money. I deserve to be in there. I need a one-on-one. -on -one. Well, I'm called in there for a one-on-one. -on -one. So I go into the room and I'm sitting there. And right away, in my scared child, what did I do wrong? I must have done something wrong. Are they going to kick me out? I don't know what I could have done. I'm working so hard because I'm fighting for my life. And if this doesn't work, I'm going to kill myself. So I, what kind of, why should I be in here about then? It's like, screw these guys. Why am I the one in here? I'm not Lonnie who keeps going upstairs and having sex. And I'm not Greg who keeps going hot, running off campus and going four miles to get a cigarette. I'm actually doing my work. Why am I the one in here? I think they've screwed up. And so then, my bully has jumped in. Well, about that time, Vinny comes in, and he was the counselor. He was what they called the chiseler, very serious person. Now, I honor Vinny, and I want to honor him right now. Vinny has died. After 28 years of sobriety, Vinny overdosed on heroin a few years ago. So I do believe he does live on through me, and I honor him deeply for what he gave me the seeds of everything I'm talking about today and for being alive today. That shows how quickly this disease and being out of alignment is deathly. So Vinny takes me in and I'm sitting there. He's like, Ted, we gotta figure out this third step. We gotta, you know, we gotta figure out a way for you to turn your will over to a higher power of your understanding. I'm like, Vinny, I explained to him why couldn't he goes, he goes, I get it, I get it, Ted, I, I get it. And uh, he goes, Ted, tell me three words you believe in. And so I paused, which will give me a chance to take a drink. So I paused. 
And still, this was only six months after my mother-in-law and my two children had died. So I'm still totally thinking like a dad. And so I said, Patience. Can't hear me, patience. And you can't see it very well either, so be patient. Unconditional love. So that says unconditional love because I can see it's right in the light. And compassion. And he took the marker, and I'm not going to because I'm in the movie. He threw it up in the air and says, there's your higher power. And he walked out of the room. Now, I sit in the chair. Now a little bit of my scared child comes in. It's like, so do I get up and go back to group now? Do I still sit here? And so I just sat there. And then he came walking in with a big smile on his face because he knew. I'm sure he had done it before, but he had me in quite a quandary. And he goes, look, Ted, a higher power might be three words on a board. That's where it might start. It might be three words on a board. So a higher power might be patience, unconditional love, compassion. I just need to run my life through that, meaning before I just make a decision and take action, I run it through that filter before I take action. And that made sense to me. So I left going, kind of scratching my head, trying to let that absorb, thinking about that. And then I got back to the big group, which is where we always were. I was chair four on the far side of the curve of 28 people for 28 days. And right as I was sitting down, the counselor inside said, they were talking about this topic, of course, said, God is understanding. And she goes, all that means is God is standing under. And as she did this piece, it happened to be at the same moment that I was sitting down. And I felt like I sat in that chair three inches deeper because something was standing under me. I didn't even trust a chair. When she said that, something happened, that aha moment known as the phenomenological transformative moment, something happened. And all of a sudden, God wasn't this evil thing. There was a new understanding of my higher power. Now, right before I went to treatment, we had happened to have had a big fire in Taos. Huge fire. And, uh, and I definitely looked at that scar all the time because, of course, it was right at the same time my daughters died. But I just remember sitting there. I went for a little walk around the pond. And I go, oh, you know, God doesn't sit up there or whatever and go, I'm taking out that ponderosa pine. That pine is going down. No. Things happen. Lightning hits trees. And fires happen. Children die. Car crashes happen. Cancer happens. Coronavirus happens. But what can happen is while the universe has these things happen, I can still be held and walk through those difficult times. So there was a shift in me just by this piece. And then I knew it was my job to be aligned to walk through those. So in that moment, all of a sudden, now I knew I was being held, even if it wasn't by the external world around me. Stuff is going to happen. Life is messy, but there is understanding, and I am held. When we have lost, that piece kind of, there's a free fall, and grief, we rebuild that understanding. And each time, my higher power continues to grow. So with that, I start thinking more. I like to think about these things. It's probably my drug of choice, is trying to figure out how do we move emotional growing to a 
emotional growth to a higher place for myself, for others? How does the grief process continue to grow? How does God grow? How do we try to get message out that makes sense to them, not that's from me? All those pieces. So I still remember being at treatment because I still had a few days left. I started thinking about it. And right before my daughters died, I had been teaching school. That's what I had been. I was a school teacher for 14 years. And I had the behavioral mod kids. I had the, they were proudly to say, the bad boys and the bad girls. And I was the bad teacher. And so we all hung out together. And one of the things I really worked with them that year was responsibility. And I took that word and I flipped it around. And so instead of responsible, I had the ability to respond consciously. The ability to respond. And we really pushed that the year before my girls died. And I didn't realize it, but I was ingraining it into me. And so all of a sudden, and from this free fall, from all these losses, I started to realize I had a responsibility. I had the ability to respond. And if I was going to respond consciously, I had to come from my true identity rather than going against it and coming from my scared child or bully. So it's like, wow, that's so awesome. And I'm still like, yeah, but I don't know about this God thing. God still kind of screwed me over. Uh, life sucks and it sucks to be me. And so that was still there. And so I continued. I've been a tennis pro for quite a long time. I started thinking about that. And I was like, okay, this piece of understanding. Okay, now I have to have the ability to respond consciously. And I realized that is where my destiny lived. By responding, excuse me, by responding consciously, I could work with my higher power. So just like in tennis, a good doubles team does not play singles with four people on the court. It's me with a teammate. So my brain was willing to have me be a co-creator with my higher power. So now, as a co-creator with my higher power, I had choice, and I could start to trust that I was being held by running it through. So then, this was probably my higher power. I'm going to back up for a minute. These words up here, when I left Vinny's room of patience, unconditional love, and compassion, if you notice, they're not down here. They're not in purity of intent. Honesty, integrity, spiritual seeker, service to people, humor, or co-creator with my higher power. When I came up with these and I got so excited, they, I do believe are the glue that hold these together. But at that time, my scared child grabbed these, took it back to relationship, and said, if I'm more patient, this relationship will work. If I give unconditional love to this partner, this relationship will work. If I'm more compassionate, this relationship will work. So the scared child just grabbed that and said, yeah, I've got it now. Instead, I was able to slowly realize if I can be more patient with myself, I can be more conscious because I'm safer within myself. To my best ability, if I can give myself unconditional love as a human doing my best on this earth, I can be more safe, which means I can come from my frontal lobe. And I can have compassion and empathy for me to be conscious and come from here knowing I'm still going to goof. And when I goof, I can always do a ninth step and a tenth step. So I just wanted to come back to that for a minute. Now, within this, now I have a co-creator that I get to play doubles with, with my higher power. I pause, make sure that I'm being, I'm having my ability to respond consciously. This has led to me rebuilding my life, finding passion, and moving forward. And it's like, well, how's that? What I realized is then I had to think about 
um, how to put these into action. If we use the tennis court or the tennis idea, I needed to have a tennis racket, I needed some tennis balls, and I needed a court. So I needed to build that piece. Um, so about oh, 18 years ago, I was doing a lot of work out in Hollywood on different situations out there um, within the movie world and emotional healing. I realized, man, these guys are really, guys and gals, were really into this red carpet idea. How can I use that? And the red carpet being the Oscar or whatever award and these different pieces. There was such a focus on that. I was like, okay, how do I implement that into this? And just by the way, Benny's seed to start this was this. And then I played with it and started growing this. There's different people that have similar ideas. It's it's not new from me. But this was the seed I want to honor with Benny. So I took this Hollywood idea. Okay. So my job is to be a conscious observer with responsibility called the ability to respond consciously and then trust how it manifests. Okay, I'll, I'll go along with that. So I pictured that red carpet, but it was only unrolled about five steps. As a skier, and I'm hoping some of you are skiers, you know, when we ski, we have to look down the line and then we come back to the present turn or we blow out. But we can't know exactly what the end is because there's gonna be a rock or a person or something in the way. So it's the same idea. So if this carpet is unrolled four or five steps, then I know where I'm trying to get, but then I come back to the next step. Here I believe, you know, we talk a lot about no control. I believe the one place we have control is a decision. I'm going to decide to raise my right hand to see seen on the camera. Expo. Okay, I don't know once I make that decision if my arm falls off or if the computer falls and you can't see it, but I get to make that decision. So I run it through this and then take the action, surrendering the outcome. So that's how this piece is. With that red carpet, I have about five steps out. And I choose to take a step. Phew, I was able to. And then I take another step. So each time I'm coming back to this. It's a discipline, but disciplines open up to bounty. So in this, I get to start taking my steps. Now, if I start looking 10 steps out, I trip over the red carpet, get laid out, fall off the screen, and well, if I'm conscious, what do I do? I step back up, get back on, get on this side, and take those next steps. Now, I am a big believer that we're supposed to work towards goals. And here's a big piece, and here's where I believe it's a spiritual path with my authentic self walking with a higher power of my understanding. In that piece, I'm here. I set a goal. So that goal is way out there. I'm going to have it be the camera. Okay, that's my goal. But then by doing this work, I take my next step. And then see how I'm aligned. And I take my next step. Now, my goals might change because I'm an organic being, hopefully a spiritual being. I believe that strongly. And all of a sudden, the goal I did have may need to adapt and be reassessed. When we started Golden Wheel Retreat, actually before we started it, I planned on it being a kid's camp. If it was a kid's camp, I still wouldn't be married to Marcella. We've been together for 22 years now. Um, when we built the chapel, which we built with 10, 12-year-olds, they homeschooled for us to build the capilla. Um, we saw very quickly how tough it is to have kids there all the time. So Marcelo would be like, how can something blow up in the microwave every day? How can there be boogers on the wall every day? How can there be someone walking through the screen every day? So we learned it wasn't going to be a kid's camp. 
Instead, it ended up being what it is today. But we took our steps and we started building. We did the homeschooling to build the chapel. We took the next step. We took the next step. Instead of getting so caught out there that we just trip, get overwhelmed, and fumble. When we have loss, when we have addiction, we're caught in the past, overwhelmed by the future, two collide, and we're in a free fall. As we rebuild incrementally and start to build our foundation, then we can take our step, gather the data, and see what our next step is. And if I've stepped a way that doesn't serve me, I feel the discomfort and take my next step to realign. Our brain is so good, we will step out of alignment, adapt, step out of alignment, and adapt, and in other words, forget who we are. But as that stretch from our true core gets further and further, there's a snap. And that's recovery, is that opportunity to realign, come from here. So I do believe we set goals, we set our missions, and then we adapt to those pieces. So I have a few other things. I think I'm good, Julie. What do I have, about 10 minutes? Is that good? Sounds good to me. Okay, great, thanks. <laughs> I just got Julie's yes. I couldn't get in my password and then I was panicking and becoming a scared child. So thank you, Jeremy, <laughs> for jumping in there. Um, so I wanna back up and just review some of the stuff that I've talked about. As we come into this world, we each are individuals and we're not supposed to be the same. We each have our unique idiosyncrasies, powers, strengths, whatever you want to call them, as well as our tweakiness. I'm a piler, not a filer. And so, of course, I've got Luella who helps get those piles into files. And so she can make sure I'm here today talking to you. And so we might be macro, we might be micro, but we're each individualized and we're not supposed to be everything. And the clearer this piece gets, the more we can be aligned and it becomes our vessel. From this, we can then find this expansive piece in us because we're doing our truth. We're not veered and skewed and off alignment and always trying to work with that balance. We're trying to come from this place. And when we're out of alignment, we realign. In the midst of that, we have losses, unresolved losses. We have addiction that steps in. We have different pieces. And these guys kind of take over the show. Now, when we have loss, I've left this up here, we actually have an emotional traumatic brain injury. Our frontal lobe shuts down. And those of you that were in the talk last time, we talked a lot about that. We're not going to as much today. But it's just good for us to know. In the midst of disruption, destruction leads to chaos that leads to the opportunity for reconstruction or recycling the cycle. We have this piece where our frontal lobe shuts down because I'm in survival mode. That's these guys. If we do our work, we start to realign to be centered here. Otherwise, we're out of balance. Most people, We'll know one of these guys better than the other. It doesn't mean the other doesn't exist. So you just start playing with it. If we can also, me as a professional or me as just good old Ted, when these things pop up, that's a victory. That means my psyche is feeling enough infrastructure and trust that they can rise to the surface. I don't bop them on the head. Instead, I see what they are. So anytime I learn something new about me, I see it as I'm doing my work and building more infrastructure because another lens has come off. So maybe I don't know that I'm a screamer. And all of a sudden I find that out. 
or that I leverage by being dominant, or I leverage by being subservient and throwing guilt bombs. So any of these pieces, the more I can remove those lens, the more serenity I start to have because I have peace here, not expecting I have serenity here because the outer world usually is not going to be that peaceful. Within a loss at the beginning in that emotional traumatic brain injury, I have loss of short-term memory. I have high impulsivity. I have high irritability. And I am very hypersensitive. And so these guys, the bully and the scared child, those survival skills, are kind of running the show. But as I do my work and keep working and coming back to my true identity, or the parent holding that hurt child, however you want to see that, these guys get quieter. They start <coughs> trusting the true identity more and more. And so the monkey chatter gets quieter, quieter, and quieter because these two know that someone's home. Any of you that do internal family systems, this fits in very well with that. This becomes the parent that now can take care of the disruptive children because disruption is a scream for help. So all of a sudden, when I feel these guys come up, I know something's out of balance. I can stop. And from that parent figure, I can take care of them. Not beat them up. God, I should have known better than that. But actually feel them. This for me is such a tender piece. I try to take care of these guys, not enable them, but listen, see, and value them the same way I wish I still could with my daughters. I want to be that good of a parent of listening to them, not doing what they say, listening to them, and then taking that data figure out the next step in my life. From there, I do believe in the saying, God has a plan for me, and it's unfolding one breath at a time, or one step at a time. Change God to whatever you want. Um, I worked with the atheist groups at Betty Ford Center. It was still the same thing. I have a plan. There is a plan. But all I can do right now is take the next step. So whatever that area is, all of a sudden I can have a step three, no matter what my beliefs are. Because it's about turning it over, but me figuring out to take that next step with the support of something larger than me. That reopens my frontal lobe, which is where creativity, love, connection, spirituality, self-realization, growth, evolution, all these pieces live rather than stagnant, caught in the past, overwhelmed by the future with no present, just frenetic energy. So if we can continue to work with those pieces, coming from here, I get to learn more and more about me. If you notice, I don't have a list of 40. There's only five, maybe six. Maybe another one comes, but that, since 1997, those are the pieces that I found that just said, yes, these are me. And it doesn't mean I don't still be here. So that's what I was hoping we could talk about today. And moving from that edge, knowing that we've all fallen, looking up out of that canyon and realizing one step at a time, I'm redefining myself and finding my authentic truth to find the bounty of this world.